Well, will massive fiscal imbalances push the U.S. to the point of no return? And what will it mean for future tax rates? And what about programs like Social Security and Medicare? David Walker, author and former Comptroller General of the U.S. government, joins us right after this. Well, David Walker is a man that needs no introduction, but we're going to give him one anyway. He served as the seventh Comptroller General of the United States. He was also the CEO of the U.S. Government Accountability uh, Office, the GAO, for 10 years under Bush and then the Clinton administrations. We've talked a lot on this channel about the importance not just of correct investment positioning, but correct asset positioning so as to produce the absolute lowest tax result for your investments. And I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. David Walker, it's great to have you with us. Ron, good to be with you. Thank you for the opportunity. So let's begin with today. Bring us up to speed. We know that the U.S. is still considered a global superpower. Yet, as you highlight in your latest book, there are some massive risks that are threatening not just America's future, but its stability. Tell us more. Well, the truth is the United States has been the only real superpower since World War II. By that, I mean a country that is well-respected globally, that has economic, diplomatic, and military power on a global scale, as well as cultural influence on a global scale. The Soviet Union uh, did not have economic uh, and uh, did not have global economic power and did not have cultural influence globally. But now we're faced with China. Uh, China has already passed the United States in GDP based on purchasing power parity. It already has more diplomatic missions than we do. It's number two military, militarily and committed to passing this. And it clearly has significant cultural uh, influence as well. And so we need to take that seriously. We need to also understand that there are shifting alliances in the world. There are a number of countries, including China, Russia, uh, Iran, and others that are trying to ally against the United States interest. Uh, and against the historical liberal world order. Uh, at the same point in time, we face huge increases in debt to GDP. And unlike at the end of World War II, where we were bringing that down dramatically, we're increasing it dramatically. We've got a fiscal policy, which is tax and spending, which is unsustainable. We've got a monetary policy, which is unsustainable. That combined with growing gaps in society put us at risk. Uh, and it, it's important that we learn the lessons from history, that we learn from others, and that we take steps to be able to help make sure that we remain a superpower and to make sure that our future is better than our past. David Walker joining us, his latest book, America in 2040, Still a Superpower. It's available at amazon.com. Do yourself a favor and go get a copy. Now we're gonna frame this conversation, not so much from a political angle, but I wanna focus on the, the financial ramifications for this country and for every single one of us that live here. Now let's talk first though about coronavirus this bill, which has just been signed into law, we're, we're now, what is this, uh, the second round? And, and more rounds of coronavirus relief are probably ahead. So the question here that I have for you, and you talk about this in the book, so these relief packages, you know, are definitely needed, but they also contain a lot of stuff, a lot of clutter that undermine them with this wasteful spending. And you kind of talk about that, which only adds to the U.S. government's mounting debt problems. Tell us more. Well, we were already on an unsustainable uh, path with regard to debt to GDP before COVID-19. And COVID-19 has obviously exacerbated that. I mean, debt to GDP went up 20% in fiscal 2020 alone. Uh, we've already, the, the latest round of uh, uh, COVID-19 legislation is the third round of legislation. So we now have between three and $4 trillion worth of legislation. Some of that was clearly needed. Uh, other parts of it, frankly, weren't properly targeted. Uh, and as typically is the case at the end of the year, when you're trying to get something on must pass legislation, you get a lot of things that get added to it that don't necessarily relate at all to COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so the bottom line is, is look, we have to do what we need to do to defeat COVID-19. We will defeat it. But we also have to recognize that we that it has made our financial situation much worse. Uh, and that once we do defeat COVID-19, which I think is a matter of months, not a matter of years, 
then we need to put a mechanism in place that will enable us to put our finances in order because we're clearly in a situation where um, you know debt to GDP is too high. We're growing debt faster than we're growing in the economy, and that puts our, our future at risk. Now, you do an amazing job of explaining the fiscal crisis that's brewing within the U.S. government, and I take it that you know Dr. Larry Kotlikoff at Boston University. He I did know Larry. Okay, yeah. excellent. Yeah, he does, as you know, fiscal gap accounting, which projects, projects true national debt. And he, according to his figures, it's not the $27 trillion headline figure that we all always hear about, but it's a monstrous $240 trillion. So I got to ask you, and I know you're one of the few people that can correctly answer this question, which national debt figure is correct? Is it $27 trillion or is it $240 trillion? Well, first, it depends on how you want to define it, okay? Uh, if you look at the $27 trillion, that's basically the combination of debt held by the public and debt held by the so-called trust funds, meaning Social Security, Medicare, et cetera, all right? But on top of that, if you look at the balance sheet uh, of the United States government, you find that we've got trillions of unfunded civilian and military pensions, retiree health care, environmental cleanup costs, and a variety of other things. And then on top of that, when you look off the balance sheet and the so-called footnotes, you find out that we've got tens of trillions of dollars in unfunded promises associated with Social Security and Medicare. Uh, now, the financial statements for the U.S. government assume a 75-year time horizon. That's what it does. And when you do that, you come close to $100 trillion when you add all those things that I just mentioned. Larry wants to assume a perpetuity, meaning the end of time. Now, the problem I have with that is, what's the end of time? Who can tell you when the end of time is, right? My personal view is if you use the 75-year number, which is what the financial statements use, you get a big and bad and ugly number, which is plenty bad enough, okay? So, so the bottom line is it is much worse than the 27. It's at least four times bigger than that. And depending upon what time horizon you want to use, uh, you can make it worse if you want to. Yeah, I don't care what calculator you use. It's still a lot of bananas. Uh, now, I probably should have asked you this question first, and maybe you can enlighten our audience about fiscal gap accounting in the first place. What is it and, and why is the U.S., according to, to what I'm aware of, why is this the only developed nation that doesn't use fiscal gap accounting that I'm aware of? Well, let's talk about how the U.S. government defines fiscal gap. And Larry can talk to you about how he find, defines it. The way that the U.S. government defines the fiscal gap is what is the gap as a percentage of GDP between the projected revenues for the next 75 years and the projected expenses for the next 75 years? So how, how, much, how much as a percentage of GDP would you have to either raise revenue and or cut spending immediately and permanently in order to achieve uh, the same level of debt to GDP at the end of 75 years as when you start. Now, here's part of the problem with that. That assumes that the debt to GDP at the beginning is acceptable. And I reject that assumption because we're already at the point where debt to GDP is about to pass the all-time post-World War II record. And so therefore, I don't believe that the beginning debt to GDP is acceptable. And what we have to do is rather than talk about a fiscal gap, we need to talk about a sustainability gap, which I believe needs to target a level of debt to GDP that is reasonable, that is sustainable, and that we need to put a, a, a mechanism in place that will enable us to get there within the next 10 to 20 years and to stay there so that we don't have a fiscal price crisis and so that our future will be better than our past. Now, your book also talks about how COVID-19 has accelerated the timeline for the complete exhaustion of money needed to keep programs like Social Security and Medicare fully afloat. Trust funds like Medicare Part A will be gone by 2023, and for Social Security, it's 2032. Those are accelerated timelines. So what happens after these deadlines are reached? Can't Congress just continue to kick the can and delay the problem for another 15 or 20 years? Well, COVID-19, uh, so far, as of the end of the fiscal year, which was September 30, was estimated to accelerate the so-called trust fund exhaustion dates by about three years. And the estimate at that time was 2023 for Medicare Part A and about 2031 for the combined Social Security and uh, the Social Security trust funds, meaning retirement and disability. 
What it would mean if they do nothing is it would mean that healthcare providers would be cut 10 to 15 percent across the board on their payments effective in 2023, and that in 2031, that Social Security recipients would have their their monthly benefit checks cut by over 20 percent uh, immediately and permanently. Now, you and I both know that those are unacceptable political outcomes. Uh, something can, should, and I, in my view, will be done before you get to those dates. But the whole point is, why do you want to wait till you hit the, the precipice? I mean, if you if you have a large known and growing problem, if you face an abyss that you know that that is clearly out there and that is actually getting closer closer with the passage of time. Why can't our political leaders understand that they should act sooner rather than later so that the power of compounding works for us rather than against us? You know, Einstein said the most powerful force on earth was not nuclear energy, it's the power of compounding. And when you're an investor and you make tough choices sooner rather than later, it works for you. When you're a debtor or you kick the count down the road on making tough choices, it works against you. It's time that we get it starting to work for us rather than against us. You cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. That's what Abraham Lincoln once said. And we know that government cannot borrow its way out of debt. It certainly can't print its way out of debt, which means they either cut spending or increase income tax rates or some combination of the two. And so how would that look? How high do you think income tax rates would need to go in order to fix the problem? And and do you have any guess on that timeline uh, sure. for rising taxes? First, you can't dig your way out of a hole. You have to climb out of a hole, all right? And climbing, we cannot solve this problem solely through economic growth, although we need pro-growth policies because the whole bottom line, the whole point is you want to borrow the, you want to grow the denominator of debt to GDP faster than the numerator. At the end of World War II, we didn't pay off any debt, but we grew the denominator much faster than the numerator, so debt to GDP plunged. Now it's going the other way. Look, here's the bottom line. We're going to have to reprioritize and cut projected spending. We're going to have to reform social insurance programs to make them solvent, sustainable, secure for the future. We're going to have to raise revenues, all right? Uh, uh, And we're going to have to do that in a way that hopefully does not undercut economic growth so that we can bring debt as a percentage of the economy down to a reasonable, sustainable level over about the next 10 to 20 years and be in a position to keep it there. The truth is tax rates are the lowest they're ever gonna be in our lifetime right now. They're going up, Uh, they're going up significantly. Uh, We can debate when, we can debate in what form, Uh, you know, uh, but it's a simple, there, there are two simple reasons for it. Number one, math. That's the new four-letter word in fiscal policy. Number two, political reality. You know, the people who vote the most are seniors, all right? The people who vote the least are young people. The people that are getting the tab are young people. And so therefore, you know, the, the longer you wait because of the power of compounding, the more difficult it is politically, the bigger the changes you have to make, the less transition time that you have, uh, and and because of what we said, the power of compounding, you know, you know, the bigger the problem and the the greater the potential risk of failure failure to act. Well, and and the greater urgency there is for uh, investors and individuals to take note and to properly position their investments and assets accordingly. It's been an enlightening conversation. Congratulations on the new book, and I really hope that we get a chance to do it again. I'd be happy to do it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Check out David Walker's latest book, America in 2040. It's available at Amazon.com. Don't forget to subscribe to ETF Guide TV. Watch our original series, ETF Battles, and the Portfolio Report Card. I'm Ron DeLegge. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.